Well, good morning, people of God. Grace and peace to you from God, our Father, and our Lord Jesus Christ. It is my joy to be with you and worship this day as we gather as the people of God. We gather in the presence of our Lord who comes and meets us in fullness of grace here at the table. We gather with one another to worship and to praise, but also to see Christ in one another and to be Christ to one another and to the world, to share um, Jesus who has given himself for us, who fills with his spirit, to share that spirit with those of the world around us, including one another. Um, I'm reminded on this Valentine's Day, um, all the calls to love, and that one of those is to love one another, that by this, the others will know that you are my disciples, that we love one another. On this Valentine's Day, when we talk about love so much, may that be uh, at the heart of who we are, how we act, and how we live our faith out together. That's also my very subtle reminder to all the guys out there that this is Valentine's Day, don't forget. So just remember that. All right. Um, it's also a special week for us. This is a week in the life of the church um, that we begin the season of Lent on Wednesday. Um, Ash Wednesday is this Wednesday. We do have special services throughout the Lenten season, particularly on Ash Wednesday. We have a 10 a.m. service, and we have a 6 p.m. service. They are the same service. Um, and that will be with a communion and the imposition of ashes. Well, now, the way we're doing that, because obviously we think about touching people and having to you know, go between people in that way, um, we're using individual applicators for each person so that we make sure contact's a minimum, but we can still have that meaningful time together. Um, if you can't make it into one of the services, and we hope everybody will sign up and be a part of those, if you can't be, we do have imposition of ashes curbside like we do our communion. We're going to be doing that on Wednesday from noon until 2, so kind of right between the two services. From noon till 2, we'll have um, drive through or, or curbside um, ashes and prayer. So uh, that means there should be time for anyone here to be able to arrive and be a part of those. Let your friends and neighbors know as well. Um, there are those who uh, work that can't make it in, but maybe on their lunch break could come by and take part in some prayer and the ashes as well. Uh, tomorrow morning from 9 to 10, we do have our standard um, curbside communion hour that we have every week on Mondays. And of course, from 8 till 9, we have the same thing at our Lake Weir campus. Beyond that, <clears throat> excuse me, beyond that, just to catch you up on other things going on, I'm going to ask for you to be in prayer for the Arnold family. Our member Terry Arnold passed away on um, this last Tuesday. Uh, we have no word about an upcoming service here or abroad at this time, but we do ask for you to uphold the family in prayer. And we have several other families going through some very difficult times of health um, and concern right now as well. And just ask you to keep all those you know of in prayer, but ask that God would bless all those he knows as well that are in a time of struggle. With that, I'm asking you to stand where you are as we join our voices together in our call to worship. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, the maker of heaven and earth, the Word made flesh, the Lord, and the giver of life. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. God of glory, God of peace, we confess that we are not at peace with others or with ourselves. We bring to you all that tears us apart, discord in our families, violence in our world, our own conflicted hearts. In your mercy, mend us. Reconnect us to one another and to you. Let peace reign over all the earth through the Prince of Peace, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. In the Word who has come to dwell with us, God has given us grace upon grace, forgiveness that is stronger than our sins, love that can heal every broken heart. Hear this word of God's pardon and peace. 
In the name of Jesus, our Savior, you are free from all of your sins. Rise and shine, for your light has come. Amen. of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all.
let us pray together. Dazzling Lord, in blinding light, you showed your disciples a hint of your power and purpose. Reveal yourself to us today. Show us what you desire of us and how to broadcast your love to the world. For the sake of the one who keeps company with the prophets, Moses and Elijah, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The lesson begins. Your love, Lord, reaches to the heavens, your faithfulness to the skies. Your righteousness is like the highest mountain, your justice like the deep. You, Lord, preserve both people and animals. How priceless is your unfailing love, O God. People take refuge in the shadow of your wings. They feast on the abundance of your house. You give them drink from your river of delights. For with you is the fountain of life. In your light we see light. Continue your love to those who know you, your righteousness to the upright in heart. The word of the Lord. This is the Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the ninth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. About eight days after Jesus said this, he took Peter, John, and James with him and went up onto a mountain to pray. As he was praying, the appearance of his face changed and his clothes became as bright as a flash of lightning. Two men, Moses and Elijah, appeared in glorious splendor, talking with Jesus. They spoke about his departure, which he was about to bring to fulfillment in Jerusalem. Peter and his companions were very sleepy, but when they became fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men standing with him. As the men were leaving Jesus, Peter said to him, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what he was saying. While he was speaking, a cloud appeared and covered them, and they were afraid as they entered the cloud. A voice came from the cloud saying, This is my son whom I have chosen. Listen to him. When the voice had spoken, they found that Jesus was alone. The disciples kept this to themselves and did not tell anyone at the time what they had seen. The next day when they came down from the mountain, a large crowd met him. A man in the crowd called out, Teacher, I beg you to look at my son, for he is my only child. A spirit seizes him and he suddenly screams. It throws him into convulsions so that he foams at the mouth. It scarcely ever leaves him and is destroying him. I begged your disciples to drive it out, but they could not. You unbelieving and perverse generation, Jesus replied. How long shall I stay with you and put up with you? Bring your son here. Even while the boy was coming, the demon threw him to the ground in a convulsion. But Jesus rebuked the impure spirit, healed the boy, and gave him back to his father. And they were all amazed at the greatness of God. While everyone was marveling at all that Jesus did, he said to his disciples, Listen carefully to what I am about to tell you. The Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. But they did not understand what this meant. It was hidden from them, so they could not grasp it, and they were afraid to ask him about it. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated and let us pray. Now speak, Lord, in this moment, while we wait on thee, And hush our hearts to listen with expectancy. Amen. How important are appearances to us? Do they matter? Doing things for the sake of appearance, we've heard that term before. 
or judging things by appearance. I mean, we'd all love to be able to say that we never judge a book by its cover, right? We, we know we probably shouldn't do that, but the reality is we all too often do judge a book by its cover. All too often we do look at appearances and, and make decisions based upon what we see or have a, a visceral knee-jerk reaction to something that we behold or something we experience that makes us assume what's really going on. And sometimes we're right, but a lot of times we're far off course. I know that for me, uh, there's judgment in a lot of areas, especially when it comes to movies. I don't know if you're like me in that. Um, I love reading books. I have read books my whole life and really get into them. And then they'll make a movie based on a book that I've read. And I never like the movies that much because they never are the way that it's supposed to be. Now, I'm saying supposed to be because of the way I want it to be. Sometimes it's very obvious. They have characters who look nothing like the description in the book, and that's an obvious departure for me. But other times, they just are played out differently than it was in the, the movie in my mind, the way that I saw it as I read the book. And it, it's, dis, it's discomforting me. It feels awkward to me that it's not the way I expect it to be. Because so often, that's what we get in trouble for when it comes to our assumptions about appearances. We have a set of expectations of the way things are supposed to be, according to us. And when things don't match up to our expectations and our assumptions, then we start to have a bit of a problem, and all too often we become judgmental, assuming that our way is the proper way. Now, if that's who you are, if you ever fall into that trap even once in a while, I'm not telling you it's a good thing, but you're not alone. And in the future, I'm sure people will continue to do that, though through the grace of God, we should try to distance ourselves from that attitude. In 1884, a moment like that of judging by appearances made a big impact in the future. A young man died in 1884, and after his funeral, his grieving parents wanted to do something to honor him, to memorialize him. So they met with Charles Eliot, who was then the president of Harvard University. Uh, he was willing to see them because he'd heard the sad story. He wanted to give them a little bit of time in his busy schedule to at least you know, make them feel comforted. So they sat down, and after a few pleasantries, they sa he said, well, what can I do for you today? They said, well... We want to honor our son in some small way to, to honor his life. We thought maybe we'd like to do something here at the school. He said, so are you thinking about maybe a scholarship then in his name? And they looked at each other and thought for a moment, said, well, no, we've actually been talking and we're thinking something more substantial than that, maybe, maybe a building. And Elliot looked them over, this unassuming kind of plain pair. And the numbers didn't tick up right in his mind and so he kind of, brushed them off and said, well, you know, I think that's quite an undertaking and it's very, very expensive. I would suggest perhaps you think about just doing a scholarship instead. Looking at each other once more, they thanked for his time, they got up and they left his office. He didn't think anything more about it in the weeks to come. But a year later, about a year later, he got word that this plain pair had gone elsewhere. Now, I want you to remember this is the year 1884. They had gone elsewhere and they established a $26 million memorial named the Leland Stanford Junior University, better known today as Stanford University, as a memorial to their son. I wonder how often he kicked himself for not getting it later. Well, that's a problem we still face today, isn't it? That we can still do the same thing. It certainly is a problem in the times of Jesus that we see clearly evidenced in the story today, and not just in our segment of the Scripture today, but in the Scripture that immediately precedes it and what follows afterwards as well. It's a little different order than we sometimes read it, but just before this text, according to Luke, just before our story of the transfiguration today, uh, Jesus has asked the disciples who he is, uh, who the people are saying that he is, and, and they all say, oh, you could be Elijah, or you could be Moses, you could be another prophet, John the Baptist back, you could be anyone. Who do you say that I am? And Peter says, you are the Messiah, you are the Christ, you are the chosen one of God. And Jesus says, oh, they finally get it. And he begins to tell them what that means. Now, here's a watershed moment you need to understand. In that declaration, we see a change, a transformation, not only of Christ here in the, in the looks of the transfiguration, but a transformation and a, a changing of course for Jesus in what he's doing. Up to that point, 
His ministry had been about being a calling card to show that he was really who he was, kind of proof that he was the Messiah, that he did have the authority to say things he was saying, that he was the one chosen by God. The miracles and the teachings and all those things were, were just a calling card. This is who I am. You can trust my word. Have faith. With the declaration that you are the Messiah, there's a transition for Jesus to start teaching what that means. They were all happy enough. Peter, first among them, always the first one to shoot off his mouth, was the first one to say, you are the Messiah, the one chosen by God to change the world. It's good that you get that. I'm sure Peter felt very good about himself for a moment there. Until Jesus starts to describe what that means. That this is a different Messiah than the one they assume. The appearance is not matching up to their expectations. The Son of Man is going to have to be handed over. He's going to die, rise again. Whoa, whoa, wait a second. Whoa, 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 whoa. That can't be right. I mean, I, I know what the Messiah is supposed to be. Strong, powerful, conquering, all these things. That, that doesn't match up to what you're saying. Jesus, I, you got to be wrong about this. And he tries to rebuke Jesus. And in turn, Jesus rebukes Peter. Remember what he says to him? Get behind me what? Satan. Get behind me, Satan. Talk about going from a high of heights to a low of lows and that fast. Now, why did he call him that? It's because even though it was made, uh, made, the comments were made maybe for a better reasoning and a different vein than perhaps Satan had but in the 40 days of temptation in the wilderness. But remember what Satan had done then when Jesus was baptized, went out in the wilderness? I'll give you all the power, all the acclaim, all the glory, all the authority of this world. Just bow down to me instead. Turn away from your vocation of suffering, death, and resurrection. Turn away from what it is you're you're supposed to be doing. Do this instead. Take the easy path. It'll be better. And Jesus doesn't listen. Lord, turn aside. Don't, Don't listen. This can't be what you're supposed to be. Be a conquering hero. Be powerful. Do these great miracles. People love you for them, Jesus. Don't Don't talk about dying. Get behind me, Satan. And so he knows there's more to be done to make clear to the people who and what the Messiah really is. See, they're willing to accept a Messiah at face value if that face value is what they want it to be. But when it's different, that's not so easy. And we see it clearly also in the people that follow at the end of our story. Jesus has been up on the Mount of Transfiguration. This wonderful event has happened. Comes back down the mountain. Goes right back out into the valley, into the people's lives to do ministry. And he gets hit right away with a big crowd looking for him. Who are looking for the wonder man. To do wonders and signs and miracles and all this exciting stuff. To be a part of that. And there's a man there who has a real need. Not just to watch and see him do it. But his son is having convulsions and fits. He wants him healed. They want Jesus to change the world. Bit by bit, moment by moment, situation by situation, they want him to change the world, to take the world they know with its brokenness and make it into a better version of the world they know. Just clean up the things we know, Lord. Take away all the hardship. Make it easier for us. Make this world a better place to be for us so we're happier and more content and more at peace. How many of you would like to be more at peace in your lives? How many of you like to be a little more joyous and happy in your lives? How many of you like to be more content in your lives? Aha, trick question. To be content has nothing to do with how much you get. It has to do with being at peace with what you have. Being at peace not with, in their case, the Messiah they wanted to be and the world they wanted to be, but being at peace with the Messiah they are given and the world and kingdom he ushers in which doesn't look a lot like what they want it to be in the moment. Oh, they know there's all those great statements about what the kingdom is supposed to be and what the Messiah is supposed to do, but those are highfalutin words. Those are are big terms that are eternal and wonderful and majestic, but we're talking about concrete, real world nuts and bolts. God, we want to see things change to make our lives better today. The disciples of all people, of all people, we think would understand this, but Jesus knows of all people, they need some extra help. He takes them aside for tutoring. Now, I want you to think about that. When Jesus takes them aside, they might think that they're getting special attention, that, you know, they are more worthy than everyone else. That's what you hear in the story immediately following this. They're all patting themselves on the back. 
What Jesus is really doing is giving them after school um, extra special tutoring because they are a little slower than they need to be. And takes them aside to teach them again. In this case, he takes them apart, they go up a mountain, and he takes the, the heads of the class, they think, but the ones he's going to depend on most in some ways, James and John and Peter, he takes them a little higher up. Now, that should you know, jog our memories a little bit, because it's the same kind of thing he does in the Garden of Gethsemane. Remember that story? Upper room has just happened, he's just done the first communion, he's washed their feet, all those things have happened. Judas has run off to betray him. Jesus and the other 11 go into uh, the, the uh, Garden of Gethsemane, and he goes a little apart with James, John, and Peter, takes him a little apart from the rest of the crowd for a time of prayer, and he says, would you watch with me, pray with me, watch with me? Then he removes himself a little further so he can have some quiet distance and space. Jesus does kind of the same thing here. Now, a quick note on the mountain, because there's a, a, a dispute sometimes over which mountain this is. Uh, many people who have gone to the Middle East have made pilgrimage to the mountain. It's usually Mount Tabor, uh, which is about 2,000 feet high and it's a little south um, of the region of, uh, of the Jerusalem area. And they think that that maybe is the way, the place it is. A lot of people have said that. But a lot of scholars have said recently, no, that, that doesn't make sense. This is happening just after some other events where he's in Caesarea Philippi up north. And, and not only is he there, uh, but, but he's not far out of that distance of that region the whole time he's doing this ministry. And there's another mountain up there called Mount Hermon. And Mount Hermon is not 2,000 feet high. Mount Hermon is 9,000 feet high. And that makes more sense because Matthew specifically talks about being a very high mountain. And they go up on this mountain to pray and to sit and to dwell. And when they get up there, Jesus begins to pray, much like the Garden of Gethsemane. And much like the Garden of Gethsemane, the disciples get tired. They become weary. And their heads start lolling and their eyes start getting heavy and they begin to sleep, to slumber and doze off. It sounds familiar. In the garden, Jesus keeps waking them up and reminding them that they're supposed to be watching and waiting. Now, why is it that they do this? Well, I have a supposition on that. We know in the Garden of Gethsemane, they just had a big meal and all, a long week and all those things going on. Perhaps they were just tired for all that. This time they climbed a mountain, maybe they're tired from that. But we take note that all this happens while Jesus is praying. It's while he's praying that they doze, it's while he's praying that he is transfigured, that he, his face is changed, his raiment shines like lightning and flashes. That is to say, it, it's not just bright, it's something that's utterly supernatural, that is unmistakably God at work. Why do I think they were slumbering. I don't think they knew how to pray the way Jesus prayed. I think that's part of the problem. I think the disciples, at least at this point, are still like most of us. When we pray, we, we go to God and we have a laundry list. Here's the things we, we are worried about that we want you to fix. Here's the things we want uh, as benefit in our lives. Here's the people we want you to help in our lives. It, it's a list of things that we bring before God in prayer. And that is certainly one aspect of prayer, but sometimes it becomes the only aspect of prayer. That's not how Jesus prays. Jesus goes and dwells with the Father. He spends time in intimate communion with the Father. He doesn't just pray in speaking, he prays by listening. We call this contemplative prayer in today's world. He dwells in the presence of the Father and hears what the Father has to say to him that he might then not just dwell with the Father but go forth and, and, and listen to the Father and follow the Father and do the Father's will and glorify the Father's name to do all the things he's been sent to do. He dwells to, to soak up that time and that power and that energy of being with the Father and to give himself that boost and encouragement he needs to go back into the trenches. Disciples, don't pray like that. So often they're worried about what's happening to them, what's going to be better for them, and how good they are, and how they should be better than one another, or they go to the Father, or to, to Jesus, and to either brag about the good things they've done, or to say, you need to help us, we can't make this happen on our own. Jesus is calm during a storm sleeping because he's dwelling in the Father's presence, even when he's at rest. They go and wake Jesus up because they're terrified. They're going to be swamped and lost at sea. So many times we see the difference in character and I believe so much of it has to do with this concept of prayer. And then they wake up. 
Something wakes them up, kind of like a bright light perhaps. Something wakes them up and they notice something's different, something's going on. They see they're no longer alone. Uh, the three of them are sleeping and awake now, but there's Jesus with two other people. We know they're Elijah and they're Moses because Jesus probably told everybody who they were afterwards. But why these two characters, these two great heroes of the Old Testament? Well, on one hand, it's symbolic. You have the law and the prophets bearing testimony to the primacy of the Son. You have the Old Testament hanging its hope also on this one that Jesus, this one Jesus, this one who God has sent and who God has chosen, who is anointed to go and do a particular mission. And they talk to him about that mission. Elijah and Moses are talking to Jesus about his departure, that is his death in Jerusalem. They're talking to him about it. They recognize what it is. For they too, though they came many years before, are as dependent upon that moment in history, upon that sacrifice of the Son, as anyone else. There's encouragement happening here. There's affirmation happening here. There's bolstering his courage happening here. The disciples see all this and they're excited by it. This is the heroes of their faith and this is their, their Lord and they're seeing something miraculous happen and it's amazing and maybe it reminds them of what happened with Moses when he took three friends up on a mountainside, Mount Sinai. And there he wanted to see the glory of the Lord and he had the barest glimpse of the smallest part of reflected glory from the Lord. And just the reflection off of his face when he came down was so brilliant that it terrified his friends and they asked him to wear a veil to hide it because it was so bright from a reflection of the glory of God. It's the same glory that knocked Paul down on the road to Damascus that blinded him that he talks about several times in the books of Acts. But Jesus here is not reflecting the glory of God. He's embodying the glory of God. For he is the eternal son. But I don't think what they're seeing here is a blast from the past as if somehow Jesus is removing the covering and saying, this is who I've always been. I've just been hiding it in this, or this uh, earthen coat of flesh known as humanity. I don't think it's that. I'd agree with Matt Regal, our, one of our bishops in the ELCA, and many other scholars, including uh, the famed uh, commentary writer Matthew Henry, who says this In the Transfiguration, Christ tries on his robes. I love that. This is a foretaste, a glimpsing of the glorified Jesus. This is the end result that we're getting a glimpse of of what's going to happen in his death and resurrection, that it's a fulfillment of his vocation, that this is what it's leading to. It's to answer the flagging faith of the disciples and a word of hope for us when we read the story. It's what allows John to write later after he's witnessed this in 114, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory Glorious as the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. And Peter himself, who writes later in 1 Peter 1, 16 through 18. For we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. But we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For when he received honor and glory from the fa God the Father, and the voice was borne to him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this very voice born from heaven, for we were with him on the holy mountain. The purpose is to reveal to them and to us that the suffering and death are not incompatible with heavenly glory. In fact, they're necessary for the glory that is to come. But even there, they don't get it. Peter says, Lord, this is great. This is awesome. This is the most wonderful experience of my whole life. Let's build some tents. I mean, we don't need them, Lord. Three of us, we're good. We're, we're happy to sleep out under the stars, but let's build one for you and for Moses and for Elijah, and we can just stay here. You know what that is? Besides selfishness? That's misunderstanding what Jesus has come to do again. And it's a kinder, gentler way of trying to steer Jesus away from the cross. Lord, let's just stay here. You don't need to go down to the valley. You don't need to go to Jerusalem. You don't need to let those things happen. You told us we're going to happen to you. Let's just, let's just stay here and say, this is, isn't this better? It's good, Lord. Someone once asked C.S. Lewis a very deep question. Why do the righteous suffer? 
And when we hear his answer today, I want you to think differently. I want you to hear, why did the righteous suffer? I want you to hear it asked, why did the righteous one suffer? And hear his reply that way. Why did the righteous suffer? Why not, Lewis said. They're the only ones who can take it. Why did the righteous one have to suffer? Why was he telling them this was going to happen? Because he's the only one who could take it, the suffering that was to come and the sin that came along with it. Jesus is telling them the Messiahship, this, this anointing they've been looking for, the anointed one, is defined by the suffering, death, and resurrection of the suffering servant. And transfiguration serves as proof and a glimpse of the result of this, of what is to come and why it's necessary but they want to stay put. But Jesus can't. From this moment on, he is squarely laser-focused upon the cross that awaits him in Jerusalem. So he goes down the hill, he gathers the three, they, they go down to, to meet the other disciples, and when they get there, there's a crowd waiting for Jesus because there's always a crowd waiting for Jesus. Filled with their needs and their hopes and their despairs and their desire to see miracles. And a man who's come with his son who is in desperate need. They all want to see the miracle man. Peter, James, and John, along with the rest of them, want to see Jesus act in these ways to change the world a little bit at a time. But they're forgetting what the voice said in the cloud. Not just this is the Messiah I chose. This is my son, my chosen one. Listen to him. That's the hard part. Listening. When we come to those moments in our lives where we're struggling, where we have needs or desires or wants, good or bad, whatever we're facing, and we go to God, we give the laundry list, and we always know we can turn to the Lord, and we're always asking for help, we're always asking for blessings, we're always asking God to even use us to bless others, do we ever stop to listen what it is, for what it is God is asking us to do? Or we run on and forget to listen. When they ask for help, Jesus says something that is very curt and actually harsh in my hearing. You unbelieving and perverse generation, you broken people, how long will I be here with you? How long do I have to explain to you and to fix these little needs before I must go and fix the greater problem that must be fixed? How long will it take you to finally understand See, Jesus had been revealed to them as more than they expected and proclaimed again that the signs and wonders that were, they were waiting for and excited about were simply the calling cards to prove who he was and that the follow-up of that was that suffering and death were his future for the sake of the world. It was not in lieu of his glory. It was party to it. What does that say to us about our own struggle in life and faith? Martin Luther said this, if we consider the greatness and the glory of the life we shall have when we are risen from the dead, it would not be difficult at all for us to bear the concerns of this world. That is, if we remember, we too we have raised up, we too will be glorified, we too will be given a new being, a new body, that we too will shine with brightness because we'll be there in the presence of our Lord then the worries of this world should not overly burden us. He continues, If I believe the word, he used capital W there, if I believe the word, I shall say on the last day after the sentence has been pronounced, not only gladly have I suffered um, ordinary temptations, insults, and imprisonment, but I shall also say, Oh, that I did not throw myself under the feet of all the godless for the sake of the great glory which I now see revealed, and which has come to me through the merit of Christ. We, like the disciples, often struggle with how incongruous our ways are and our desires are and our hearts are with the way of Christ. And there are times, like Peter, we want to, to bring Jesus closer to where we are to make it easier for ourselves, and there is no life in that. The only true life is for us to abandon ourselves and to cling to Christ. And that means that if we're to follow him, as disciples are, those who walk the path and apprentice and learn from Jesus, that if we're to do that, then we will need mountaintop moments declaring whose we are. 
that the Lordship of Christ in our lives will be known to everyone abundantly and clearly, that it will be radiantly shown forth that we are God's people, and we do that in how we love each other and love the world and speak boldly the purposes of Christ. But we also need to go down to the valley. We also need to spend time not just soaking it up on the mountaintop, but pouring it out in the valley in mercy ministries and feeding and healing and overcoming oppression and speaking to the brokenness and ills of individuals and of the world and sharing the peace, hope, and joy of Christ that we've received with a world so in need. Thanks be to God, we have years of hindsight that the disciples didn't have. But more than that, thanks be to God, this Wednesday we begin Lent in our 40-day pilgrimage into Easter that we can really reflect and listen to the Lord to hear what it really means for us to be a resurrection people and to dwell in his presence in a way that changes us and the world around us. So may it be this day, this Lenten season, and through the rest of our lives. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. children pray Lord and your spirit in this place Lord listen to your children pray send us love send us power send us grace Lord listen to children pray Lord send your spirit in this place Lord listen to your children pray send us love send us power send us grace Please stand as you're able. Living together in trust and hope, we confess our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, communion of saints, the forgiveness of sin, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Please be seated. Guided by Christ, made known to the nations, let us offer our prayers for the church, for the world, and for all in need. for the gospel proclamation in word and in deed, for communities of faith far and near, for all who show the face of Christ throughout the world. Lord, in your mercy. For creation, for sun, for moon, for stars, life forming in the dark earth and ocean deep, mountains, clouds, storms, and creatures seen and unseen, and for the Holy Spirit's guidance in our stewardship of God's creation. Lord, in your mercy. For those responsible for safety and protection, for emergency responders, for security guards, for attorneys and advocates, civil servants, and leaders of government, that they witness to the mercy and the justice 
throughout the world, Lord, in your mercy. For all who suffer this day, that Christ, our healer, transform sickness into health, loneliness into companionship, bereavement into consolation, and suffering into peace. Lord, in your mercy. For companions on life's journey in this worshiping community, for loved ones who cannot be with us this day, for guidance during struggles that we face, that God's glory is revealed around us and among us. Lord, in your mercy. In thanksgiving for the faithful departed who now rest from their earthly pilgrimage, especially missionaries Cyril and Methodius, that their lives of service and prayer inspire us in our living. Lord, in your mercy. Merciful God, hear the prayers of your people, spoken and silent, for the sake of the one who dwells among us, your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with your free spirit. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God, and renew a right spirit within me. Please stand as you are able. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give God thanks and praise. It is indeed a good and a joyful thing that we should always and everywhere give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior, Jesus Christ. By the leading of the star, he was shown forth to all nations. In the waters of the Jordan, you proclaimed him your beloved son. And in the miracle, the water turned into wine. He revealed your glory. And so with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their un unending hymn. Merciful God, heaven and earth are full of your glory. In great love you sent to us Jesus, your Son, who reached down to heal the sick and the suffering, and who preached good news to the poor, and who on the cross opened his arms to us all. 
On the night that he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, he gave thanks and broke it. He gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup and he gave thanks. And he gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant, sealed by my blood, which is shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so we remember the life he gave for us. He's revealed himself in the mountaintop as he comes to us in the valleys to live with us. It is through him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is God's now and forever. Broken and divided in Christ, we are united. Come now to the banquet, for all is now ready. Please be seated.